Ja, morgen. Ended album episode 54. Is that right, T? Yowza, 54. In keeping with the, the uh, tone of tonight's album, I actually I should have done the whole intro in inaudible words. Or you could have just made noise. Just yeah. Lots and a, lots of noise. Here's the loveless version of the intro. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'll just do this while you're while you're singing. <laughs> <laughs> it's um it's funny it it's kind of the first record we've done where obviously listening to it, you know, analytically, but I felt kind of old during a couple moments because it's like, you know, turn down that racket. You know? <laughs> I was just gonna say the word racket. Just a bunch of noisy racket. You know, we're going to get to said racket for sure. I, I want to, uh, I want to tell you T, that tonight we're going to take advantage of your knowledge of the art of film mm. because you are quite a film, uh, aficionado. I like films. I like, you films. like films. You did some studying of film Were you film minor. If yeah, I remember right in college, something like that. I think that was just so I could stay an extra semester, you know? Yeah. Do your victory lap. Yeah. Yeah. I was on the four and a half year plan. Should have done five. I could go back and do it again. Well, what we're going to do is we're going to take tonight's album, which is my bloody Valentine's loveless. And we're going to make a comparison to one of the most infamous films of all time. Ted, wow. do you wanna- are, are we smart enough to do this? I mean, this sounds, this sounds like it could get pretty heady. I mean, we're kind of just a couple of dumbasses. Do so you think we're going to be able to pull that off? Or? As with all things on this uh, fair podcast, we will fake our way through it. Fake no it till you make it, baby. Fake it till That's you right. make it. But before any of that, I do want to point out to our lovely and loyal listeners, tonight is a listener request show. And while this is an album that certainly w- was on the list, you know, certainly on my list, Uh, I want to give a huge shout out to listener Dan M for reaching out and making this request. And Dan M is one of our favorite listeners. We've had a chance to engage with him quite a bit. Somebody we've known since back in the day. Long time ago. And a wonderful musical taste. uh, And uh, I would imagine artistic taste in general. So Dan M. Thanks, partner. Well, Dan M is a big shoegaze guy. You know, he reached out and before you knew it, he and I were talking about our favorite ride album and, you know, kicking around some of our uh, shoegaze favorites. And uh, it's clearly a sub genre that he is very much into. So he made a suggestion of a few albums and Loveless was on the list and we are beyond happy to do it. And we do want to let all of our listeners know that we are beyond happy to take your requests as well. We've got a couple other ones on the docket that we're going to get to. But I think tonight is the first, well, maybe the second. It's the second because we did The Color and the Shape, the Foo Fighters episode Ah. was a listener request. But this will be a listener request show number two here on episode 53. So thank you, Dan M. And we're looking forward to it. So T, we will compare Loveless to this very infamous film. But not until we go round and round. Let's do it, T. Go round and round. Let's go. three albums that you have been enjoying during the past week. What do you got? Well, very good nubbins. Uh, I'm going to go with uh, the first is a band that I really like, you know, and uh, you know, they, they even heard much from them in a few years, but the arcade fire, man, I just think they're, they're an awesome band, totally creative um, Canadian. You know, I'm always partial to that. Of course. You know, there's like 25 people on stage and, you know, it's like a bunch of them are related and stuff. It's kind of weird and awesome and kooky and cool. But Neon Bible, you know, I mean, all their records are pretty good, but uh, that may have been their strong point 
you know? So remember episode 51 Q and a, that question that said, what's a band that, you know, T is into nubs that you really don't like mm. arcade fire would be on that list. Oh, I don't get it. I don't know, man. I just can't get into it. I think it's just a little overwhelming. It's just a lot of people. Well, there, there, there's a lot going on, but you know, the thing I like, they're very original. There've been a bunch of bands, you know, who uh, have tried to kind of replicate a lot of the sort of tones and approaches and, and musicianship and instrumentation and all these type of things. But, you know, it's kind of a no rules sort of band. And I was like that, you know, when there's not a set sort of template for doing things, it's, uh, it always seems like kind of a blank canvas and just a very creative outfit, you know, when Win Butler is, uh, I think a very clever, creative musician and performer in a lot of ways. So yeah, I, I it's been, you kind of have to dig into a little bit, you know, you can't just, uh, listen to their record once or twice and then sort of write it off. You gotta, you gotta dig in a little bit, but, uh, big fan, big fan of uh, neon Bible. The second is a, a band that we've talked about before called the doors. And this is soft parade. You know, we did LA woman. Uh, on a previous episode, but it's actually deciding between LA woman and soft parade. I think we made a good choice doing their finale, but, uh, soft parade's a really interesting record where, uh, Robbie Krieger, you know, made a heavy contribution. Is that the one with that has run in blue on it, right? Yes, it does. It's kind of right, right there in the middle of the record. Yeah. Yeah. My college roommate was a great dude. He used to listen to, uh, the soft parade like every day. Yeah. And Running Blue was his favorite song. He'd come home after a few pops, you know, two in the morning and, and do the whole, you know, I got them running blues, take it away. And do his like Jim Morrison impression. <laughs> nice. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that song's always is been. That, a, is that G Ham you're talking yeah, about? Yeah, yeah. It was G Ham. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Boy, that, I kind of wish I could have seen that. It was pretty And funny. Uh, the third, we're going to shout out to, uh, to our girl Bridge up in uh, PA. And I'm going to shout out uh, a live one by Fish. She is a fish aficionado. Yeah, Bridge. There you go. Yeah, BC. And uh, knows more about fish than anybody on earth, I think. And uh, had some nice fish conversations. And I think a live one is like one of the better, from a performance and production standpoint, one of the better live records ever made as far as its sound, its presentation. Not an easy band to sort of capture in the right way. It is a brilliant way to start that and, and the uh, Hampton comes alive, which is kind of a, I think that's like a six disc set. You know, those are the best ways if you're really trying to kind of look for an entry point into uh fish's sort of best live stuff. But uh, a live one has been getting a lot of spins for me as it often does late in the uh, summertime. So that is what's round and round for me. What is round and round for you, Mr. Nub? Does that mean that you and bridge like your fish? Well done. Well, I mean, I don't know. I guess <laughs> somebody had to say it, I guess. I like my fish uh, old. I like older fish. Hmm. I, I don't like the fresh, newer fish. I prefer more seasoned fish. Do you like well. fish dicks? <laughs> uh, well, uh, those are good choices, T, as always. So my first one is the debut album from the super group known as Damn Yankees. This is with... Tommy Shaw, Ted Nugent, Jack Blades, some other dude. This is the uh, the album with High Enough. It's <laughs> some good... other. Who is the other dude? I don't know. He's the drummer. Oh, just it's just it's just a guy. Yeah, yeah. I think they picked up a drummer somewhere, like on the side of the road. Well, it can't literally. technically be a super group if you like have no idea who one of the people are, right? I mean, ish. Well, three of the four were from platinum bands or solo artists, so you know. I'm going to consider it a super group, but uh, that first day making sounds really good. It's kind of Ted having fun and Tommy Shaw sounds really good. And it's got high enough and a couple other the hit singles on it. It was a good debut for sure. Second would be the album Vienna by Ultra Vox. I think this was the first record they did with Midge Ur on the lead vocals. And of course has the legendary title track. Vienna, I think one of the most beautiful songs of the eighties for sure. And third would be the, the comeback album from Creed, which is full circle. I think this was from 2007 or something like that. I got it right here. It's 2009 actually. And uh, pretty good stuff from Creed. I, you know, I'm, I'm a big Alter bridge fan and I like anything Mark Tremonti does and Scott Stabbs vocals actually sound pretty good on it. And it's a pretty strong record. 
I had our crack research team just, you know, while you were talking there about Scott Stapp, uh, do some quick um, research. You know, they're, I mean, the, they're a quick team. These guys really, it's amazing how fast they find this stuff. So the drummer of Damn Yankees is a guy named uh, Michael uh, Card- Cardalone, Card- Cardalone, Corleone. <laughs> yeah. All right. A masculine child. Um, and uh, he's from Ohio. Um, but yeah, he was kind of a session guy joined damn Yankees and now is the drummer for Leonard Skinner. So there you go. So still, I mean, now would you say super group? I mean, three of the four, Ted Nugent, Jack Blades, Tommy Shaw, that's a super group, right? Yeah. I think, yeah. Three of the four, I think that it's fair to call them a super group, but approved, approved. Do you like high enough? Oh, of course. Do you like where you go in now? Yeah. What do you think? I'm some kind of communist or something? Of course I like those songs. <laughs> Best Day Mickey song, Mr. Please. That song is such a jam. That was like a WRIF. Uh, it was never like a hit, but it's a great song off their second album for sure. Arthur P. liked that one. He used to spin that one a bit. Arthur P. used to spin it for sure. I'll tell you what Arthur P. did not spin. And that is My Bloody Valentine's Loveless <laughs> from 1991. We're going to get into some of the nerdy deeds here in a minute. But T, let me just give you the rundown of some of the comparisons between this and this infamous film. And you're going to know exactly what I'm talking about. I think. So when you take a look at my buddy, Valentine loveless, it compares with a, a legendarily uh, infamous film project. And I'll give you a couple of the highlights, both loveless and this particular film basically bankrupt the company that put the works out pretty much single handedly. Secondly, both works resulted in like uncontrolled expenses, you know, weeks and months past deadline. Both were examples of complete and utter artistic indulgence. And if you think about it, both were really the fruition of a single sort of protagonist, right? Like a single vision, a single visionary, basically a person who didn't listen to anybody else, whether they were on his team or not. They just really became totally focused on their own vision. Both works ended the commercial phase of that particular creator's career. And this is an important one in figuring this out. Both were complete commercial flops that were totally heralded in the years and decades after their release. So T, when you hear all of that, can you figure out the infamous film that Loveless should really be compared to as a work of art? It's a great call. A great comparison. I believe you're talking about 1980s Heaven's Gate directed by Michael Cimino, who, who made like one, I, I think that, uh, the, what was the, what was the movie he made? The, the deer hunter. The deer. Yeah. I mean, I personally, I hate the deer hunter, but it was acclaimed and I think he won a Oscar and, and then you, it was United artists. Wasn't it that, that, that he bankrupted, uh, over Heaven's Gate. And yeah, that's, uh, Pretty much sunk United Artists. Yeah, yeah, pretty much single-handedly. That's a neat comparison, you know, and uh, yeah, a good example of they kind of crowned him this genius of some kind because because he filmed a 45-minute, you know, dance scene in uh, The Deer Hunter. And then he decided that, you know, he could turn that into a, you know, four-hour extravaganza. And uh, I, I, don't, I don't know that it got acclaimed until he trimmed about an hour and a half from it. And then critics actually said that it was a pretty decent work of art. I think that's a a very fair uh, way to compare the two. So uh, nicely done. And both certainly beautiful in their own ways, but you almost have to accept the indulgence and the, the, the statement that was trying to be made, the vision that was trying to come out. You have to understand that in order, I think, to understand the beauty. So, T, let's roll the nerdy deeds to under cheap and let's learn a little bit more about Loveless. You want some dirty deeds? Yeah. You want some dirty deeds? All right, so Loveless was the second album by My Bloody Valentine. It was released on November 4th of 1991 by Creation Records, the label that basically was sunk as a result of this particular album. It was recorded pretty much across like a two year period between 1989 and 1991. See, I think as we go through the album today, we just have to remember it's 1991. Yeah. This album came out basically the same year that uh, Pearl Jam 10 and 
Soundgarden, Bad Motorfinger, and Nirvana, never mind, like right around that era, you also get something like My Bloody Valentine's Loveless. It really is the singular vision of Kevin Shields, who vocalist, guitarist, sampler, all around creative dude who really saw through this album through a tumultuous recording process. The band recorded in 19 different studios, used a bunch of engineers. The album was way over budget and way overdue in terms of the release date. The final production cost, nobody's confirmed it, but it was rumored to be 250,000 pounds at the time. I mean, it's just a ton of money, right? It's considered to be the, the primary album, the primary work of the shoegaze sub genre you know i'm not a big genre guy i don't enjoy talking about them but the name actually came from the idea that you know if a guitarist is making shoegaze music they're so focused on their pedals that they're looking down at their shoes the whole time right so they're gazing at their shoes oh i didn't know that's where it came from nice yeah yeah exactly so it was produced by kevin shields and como Kasich, who was the drummer in the band and probably the only other person who sort of had a major impact on Loveless, as we'll learn, it really turned into a, just a Kevin Shields, almost solo record for sure. There was one single. It is the opening track, Only Shallow, which was released in March of 1992. So that was released, you know, months after the album was released. For some reason, I had it, you know, you're, you're given the, the, these, these years and sort of this timeline information. I don't know why, but... I, Late in the process, I finally looked up the the year because I had it in my head that this was made in 1995 for some reason. I don't even know why. And when I pulled it up and saw 1991, it was it was kind of shocking. It was like, oh, like now it sort of makes sense why you know yeah. this thing yeah. um, kind of landed the way it did and influenced the way it did. Because I mean, you're right. This was way before. I mean, this was when like. Color Me Bad was on the charts, you know, and, uh, that, and, you know, Millie Vanilli, I think won a Grammy the year before it was a, certainly a unique time for a lot of the bands you mentioned, but when you put in the context that these guys or this guy, you know, sort of took the approach that they did at this stage within the industry and at this stage where this grunge movement hadn't even started. It's very eye-opening uh, in terms of how sort of lofty and unique this was at the time. Yeah, it's a great call, T. That, that's, that's a very important thing to consider when you listen to the album, when you attempt to appreciate the album, for sure. The personal credits on the album are the previously mentioned Como Kasich on drums and sampling. So there, were, there are not a lot of keyboards like synthesizers used on the album, T. All, all the textures that you hear are guitar, which is why... This album is so heralded for its kind of progression in terms of guitar noise and guitar sounds because Kevin Shields is just using, you know, in some cases, tens and tens of tracks, maybe even hundreds of guitar tracks to achieve some of these soundscapes. Uh, but Como Kasich did contribute some sampling as well. Belinda Butcher on vocals and guitar, not a lot of guitar from Belinda Butcher. In fact, probably zero guitar. No one really knows, but Kevin Shields probably handled 99% of the guitar on this album, but Blinda Butcher's vocals, you know, significant part of the sound, even though you really can't tell whether it's Shields or Butcher singing, a lot of the, the more girly vocals are Belinda Butcher, but a lot of the girly sounding vocals are Kevin Shields. <laughs> and uh, Deb Googe was the bass player uh, for the band as well. So, they, you know, they toured as this lineup. They were very much a band. I mean, My Buddy Valentine was not a solo project or anything like that. It's just, Kevin Shields became, you know, just really controlling of what Loveless was going to become and was so uncompromising. You might think, T, that he's like this prick, you know, like you, you read the My Valley Valentine story, you think, oh, that guy, he was difficult to work with, but you might think he's this jerk. He's the opposite. He, he's an incredibly sweet, very lovely guy, you know, very self aware, doesn't seem to have much of an ego at all. He's just artistic. He's an artist and he wanted to make something really uncompromising, really ahead of its time. And he put in all the work and the effort to do so. That's cool that you say that because, you know, you, you look at kind of the, the account of this recording process and the reaction of the label and kind of the, 
drama, you know, it's very similar to the Chimino Heaven's Gate project, just swirling with drama and indulgence. And you, you know, usually in that instance, you get the impression that it's a very difficult artist and somebody that perhaps could have been causing trouble for the sake of causing trouble in many instances. So I guess it's good to hear that, you know, he doesn't appear to be a, you know, a rude guy, um, but clearly a pretty difficult artist perhaps to work with for sure. Yeah. And it, it just seems that most of his motivations were artistic and creative. When the album came out, uh, Kevin Shields did predict that it was going to be a commercial flop. He didn't seem to care. And that just kind of feeds into the idea of what became and what became though, is an album that is held up as one of the best records ever made. It's held up as monumentally influential on tons of different artists from a technical perspective. It's still a wonder in a number of ways, how they achieve some of these sounds. It, it ranks high on a ton of different lists, whether that be enemies, you know, 500 greatest albums of all time, pastes 90 best albums of the nineties, uh, pitchforks, hundred greatest albums of the nineties, uh, rolling stone, 500 greatest albums of all time. I mean, it's, it's up there on all of these lists. And it's really become this sort of magnum opus, right? A lot of that, though, is in hindsight. When it first came out, it charted very poorly. It was number 47 on the European albums chart and number 24 on the UK albums chart. And it didn't last long in either, either of those charts. It did eventually go gold, but that was after its 2012 and 2021 re releases. So it's been given the sort of after the fact love that a lot of albums that we talk about in this podcast receive in, in an even more extreme way, because it was so genre bending and so weird when it came out and eventually people started to get it. Yeah. I mean, to think in, in, in 91, you know, when, when nevermind sort of blew our minds for various reasons and 10 blew our minds and all these things that were happening at the time. I mean, you know, we were fairly musical and fairly hip to kind of the onset of this new thing happening. And I guarantee you, if we would have heard Loveless at that time, we would have been like, what the hell is this? You know, so it, it's it's not the type of record that, you know, was designed to or I think even had the ability to be absorbed immediately. I think, you know, and even uh, the artist himself clearly knew that this was probably going to take some time to settle in. and. And it did, but for understandable reasons. The album virtually ended My Bloody Valentine's career. It pretty much ended Kevin Shields' career for a number of years. It took 22 years for the band to make the follow-up, which came out in 2013, and that is the album MBV. It's a good album. It's got a purple cover, and uh, it was pretty well received. But <laughs> it's got it, a it's, purple cover. It does. <laughs> is that yeah. is that the most notable? It must not be that good if that was one of the first things you said about it. What's interesting with this band though is like Loveless. Like one of the things I think about every time I hear that word is just pink. You know, I just think about the pink cover. Yeah, the washed out kind of picture of Kevin Shields. Uh, I, what is it? It's a Fender. He's so famous for it. He plays like a Fender jazz master. Yeah, he plays a jazz master and, and routes it through eighty five pedals and yeah. Yeah. And several different amps that are all sort of made to push and clip and do all those things that kind of create that. He was able to replicate the sound live actually fairly well, surprisingly. Yeah, as I would find out, you know, decades after this album came out. But see, I want to hear your story about this band. So let's get into the Wonder Stories and hear how T learned about My Bloody Valentine. Let's do Wonder Stories. <laughs> All right, see, how did you get into MBV? Well, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that I really did. Um, I mean, I, it was just as much about everything you were hearing about this band, well before you actually heard this band. I remember just hearing them noted as an influence by so many musicians and famous musicians and peer musicians and other bands that we were playing with back then. And, you know, it seemed like, you know, there are those bands that you kind of learn about and are captivated by, and then you find yourself 
at least inching your sound or your approach toward in some fashion uh, back in the 90s. So when we were all in bands back then, every so often you'd discover something that kind of made you think twice at least about your approach and your style. And, you know, this shoegaze thing was kind of a part of this spacey ambiance kind of style that sort of started to come on. And everybody pointed to My Bloody Valentine as sort of the pioneers of it. And, you know, at the time, you don't think a lot of it and you don't appreciate it. At least I didn't. So in due time, you kind of, you know, go back and revisit it every few years and try to gain an understanding of, you know, why it had such an impact. And so it's been one of those things that certainly for me has been a work in progress of, you know, trying to appreciate, trying to understand. Like I said, didn't even fully put it together that this was as early as 1991 until getting ready for this episode. So yeah, it, it's kind of one of those bands that I still don't know a ton about. This obviously was a good chance to kind of do a deep dive into the record. And, uh, and it was a good selection, interesting selection for, uh, for us to talk about. And again, just gave me one more sort of bite at the apple to continue to learn more and more about these guys. And, you know, I've, I've learned more in the last uh, few days than certainly I even knew before. So, uh, your story is probably more interesting than that, but that's my quick and dirty on my bloody Valentine. Certainly a, a group and an artist that I'm continuing to learn more and more about. So what's your wonder story? Nub? There's a few different names that come up when you think about my, my bloody Valentine story. One is our older brother, Scott, right? So that was a big deal. Scott fell in love with these guys pretty early. And this was one of those records that he was constantly pushing on to me as a guy that was playing in bands with him. It was like, you got to listen to this. You got to be influenced by this. You have to appreciate this. And it, for a period of time, it was loveless, loveless, loveless. I think that though a big part of the connection came from two different stems. One was the verve because we were all into the verve. And if you're going to be the verve, then my body Valentine is certainly a related act, you know, doing something really spacey and atmospheric and different, just like the verve was. But I think all of it was connected to the prayer chain, you know, and that was a band that we got into through the album Mercury. And the prayer chain cited the Verve and My Bloody Valentine and Ride as like three of the primary influences on how Mercury came to be. Right. One of the biggest memories I have about My Bloody Valentine is not dealing with the band themselves, but dealing with what I just mentioned, this band, the prayer chain. So we were at Cornerstone. You might remember this, T. And I'd just been getting into Loveless, you know, that year and, and starting to appreciate it. I really loved the opening track. And we were going to see very late at night, we were seeing a band called Full Zandura, which actually is pretty notable. Uh, one of the guys, Jerome, went on to be part of Switchfoot. And he was with this guy, Gyro, and they were in a band called Mortal. And then they became Full Zandura. Mm -hmm. Well, Full Zandura was playing a, a late night show at this Cornerstone Festival. And sort of out of nowhere for their encore, up came Wayne Everett and Andy Prickett from the Prayer Chain. And they jump on their respective instruments. And the first thing they play is Only Shallow. Yeah, they just play this blistering version of it, and I'm, Scott and I are going crazy. You know, it's just like, <laughs> whoa, they're playing like the you know the opening track off Loveless. How cool is that? And they played this really cool version of it, and then they went right from there into Sky High, which is like the best song off Yeah, Per Chains Mercury, and they yeah. did this like one two punch of, and it was kind of amazing because you kind of it was like here's what influenced this, and now we're going to play this, and they played a great version of Sky High, and and. The rest was uh, our little family history there, right? In terms of some memories that we saw musically. So that was, that now, stood out. Now, at what point in the night did Richard Ashcroft pass? Right. Yeah. I don't, I, I, this might've been the year before that one. <laughs> oh, was that okay? I could have, but yeah, that's, I think I, I think I told that story on the uh, 50th episode of the it, untimely death of Richard Ashcroft. The untimely non-death. That's right. <laughs> it actually could have been, you might be right. It could have been the same year the night before. Because I think what happened was Scotty might have gone up to Andy Prickett and said, hey, or, or Wayne it was, and said, hey, great job last night, blah, blah, blah. And then Wayne told him that Richard Ashcroft died. So it could have been, it, this could have been the night before. It could have led to the breaking news of Richard Ashcroft's non-death. Knowing Wayne Everett, he was probably just totally screwing with Scotty. You know? Yeah, he could have been. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And then the other memory does deal with live performance and actually does deal with the members of 
my bloody Valentine, which is that I finally got to see this band uh, right around 2014. They did a small U S tour. They only hit major markets played Chicago. It was the last time and probably the last time that I will ever drive to Chicago for a show and drive back in the same night, you Oof. know, virtually nine hours in the car. But I, I, I had to work and things. It was on a weeknight. I, I had to drive there, go see the band at the Agora, if I remember right, and then drive right back. Yeah, because they do have motels in Chicago. Yeah, I had to get back for some reason. It, and it was worth every second. <laughs> nice. Did you like that MVB album? I, I Obviously, like I said, I haven't. I need to kind of go back and revisit it. What's your take on that record? I thought it was okay. I I think it's, there's always going to be a bias in an album. That's that sort of, you know, looking forward to right. That like you had to wait that long for it. Yeah. Kind of like Chinese democracy when it came out by guns and roses, I was like rooting for it to be good, which probably led me to be a little bit biased about how good it actually is. Cause I wanted it so badly to be great. That probably plays a little bit of a role in MBV. I mean, it's got some, amazing textures and it's like a mod- more modern version of the band, which is cool. So I appreciate it. I, some of the stuff came off very well live, some of the new material. And then of course they did a lot of stuff off of isn't anything, which is the album that came up before loveless and then quite a few things off loveless as well. So a lot of good memories from my bloody Valentine and, and a lot of them surround older brother, Scott, you ready to drop the needle? You ready to hear some noise? <laughs> yeah, I think I'm ready, man. Let's do it. I'm looking forward to hearing your take. Let's uh, go track by track and drop that needle on Loveless. If you're around the right musicians who are into the right things and you're a drummer, all you'd have to do is ga, 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 ga. And then you would expect for everybody to come in with what should come next, which is the opening track and the only single on Loveless. And undoubtedly, if you can believe it, the most commercial song on this record, and that is Only Shallow. And right away, you just get this enormous wash of guitars and layers and layers and layers. All the drums are sampled. The, it, apparently Como Kasich played the parts, but Kevin Shields sampled the bits and broke them up. And I mean, he was just so controlling about every millimeter of this recording. But, uh, you know, you can hear the vocals come in there faintly at the end of the clip. See, one of the major differences between Loveless and Heaven's Gate is Heaven's Gate is packed with endless heaps of articulated dialogue. Loveless <laughs> is virtually an album top to bottom with inaudible vocals. <laughs> you, you can't hear one lyric uh, on this album. So if you're into lyrics, this album ain't for you. But you're, you're trying to get into the, the sound of the voice, the textures of Shields and Belinda Butcher's voices together and and allow the emotions of that to kind of drive what's going on here. So what comes to mind when you hear only shallow? So when you see them live, I mean, how much is he singing versus her? I mean, is it like 50, 50 or is he singing more often than she is? Or? She's saying a lot more live. Really? Okay. Yeah, it's, it's a lot of multiple vocalists going on, but she's saying a lot more live for sure. So how much on this record is it, is it pretty split? It's pretty mysterious. I mean, she definitely handled a lot of the lyrics. And what you know is that there's tons of tracks of vocals and some are her and some are him. And you just don't know who's what. The legend has it that a lot, like I said earlier, a lot of the the more like high pitched sensitive vocals are Kevin Shields. You you automatically think they're Belinda. And Belinda's actually singing some of the low parts that you wouldn't expect. Yeah. So there, it's just this album is constantly keeping you off balance, trying to figure out who's who, what's what. But what you do know is both of those voices are there and they're there a lot. And they're combining in a lot of different ways. The song introduces this sort of wavy thing, this sort of up and down melodic, if you wouldn't want to call it melodic, but these sort of waves of guitar melody that go over the wash of layers of, of you know, all sorts of different noises and effects and things like that. And then you get these sweet, inaudible vocals on top of it. It's sort of the quintessential Loveless song. Yeah, it's kind of a classic opener, really. You know, anybody who 
Anybody who's checked out My Bloody Valentine, this is probably the most memorable song from the album and certainly the most identifiable. You know, to your point, it's kind of the most melodic. He had some very creative guitar technique. You know, he used the the trem bar a lot to loosen strings and create a lot of sustain. I, I, I don't think there were a lot of studio tricks here, you know, which is part of why the thing probably ran over budget. He wanted to create these sounds. And in some cases, it probably got fairly ambitious in terms of um, usage of pedals, usage of effects, usage of amplification. You know, this is not easy to, to kind of produce these layers. And, you know, you probably could have, you know, if you were making this record today, you probably could have created a lot of those sounds through MIDI or digital means and made it very easy on yourself. But I think part of, you know, Kevin's thing was, you know, he wanted to create these sounds with this unusual and unorthodox guitar technique. And it's really cool. I mean, it's really fascinating from that standpoint. And I think part of why the album became so acclaimed was because whether you like it or not, it's extremely original, um, pushing that, that instrument to its boundaries and, and not just that instrument, but the usage of these effects in these stomp boxes and these things that can kind of create that lush sound, but you know, it's lofty. I mean, you can't just go out there and route the guitar through pedals and then, you know, expect it to work. You know, th- this was pretty ambitious to put all this layering together and make it work, uh, which was probably part of the challenge, certainly part of the complexity of the approach. But Only Shallow is about as simple as it gets here on track one. Uh, from here, obviously, you're on, you know, a bit of a ride. So very memorable track one and uh, one that I think most uh, uh, music appreciators that have uh, given My Bloody Valentine a, a chance. Uh, at absorption, um, probably remember, you know, more so than any other track in their catalog. T, before we move on to the album, I'd like to play a quick game of the game that's sweeping the nation, which is what the hell are they singing? (sighs) (laughs) Oh boy. If you could just run the first verse of only shallow real quick, let's just give it a quick listen. Oh man. Right ahead. Okay, here we go. All right, see, stop it there. What the hell are they singing? <laughs> don't ask me. I, I don't even have a guess. I mean, uh, you know, that, that he could be he could be reading the Constitution, and I wouldn't know that. I mean, <laughs> you know, what I mean, could you, like do you even make out the first line? No, no. The first line is pretty legendary. It, it, breathe? Me, is he saying breathe? The first line is 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 pretty well known. For, I think for the reason most people like me thought I, I've got to at least look up some of these words just to the is opening line is sleep like oh. a pillow downward sleep like a pillow downward yep. okay. sleep like a pillow downward and then the following is and where she won't care anyway then it resets and it does that you know phraseology over again but it says soft as a pillow touch her there where she won't dare edgy edgy t somewhere sleep like a royal that that's the first verse that's what you're hearing there well that doesn't make any sense <laughs> you did about as well on uh what the hell are they singing as anybody would too you know yeah, <laughs> yeah. can we not play that game anymore it's too hard <laughs> so i'm gonna give you an a for effort anyway okay thanks buddy all right let's get into track two with a loomer So this is the second straight Belinda Butcher lyric, which would yield a, 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 an assumption that she's doing quite a bit of the singing there. I think you can hear it. Like, but again, it's always about the two voices together. You know, that, that section it goes into there near the end of the clip maestro and good job as always that kind of do, do, do. I mean, it's a very simple melody, but what's chugging behind it is this kind of rhythmic drive and, 
And again, just all of this feedback and noise that somehow becomes these melodies. I mean, it's pretty wondrous. Yeah. Yeah. Only shallow is kind of the accessible, digestible track here. And then I think this is where you really start to get a handle for where the innovation came into play. Now it is very noisy. This is not a terribly easy listen. You know, I mean, anybody who heard this the first time and kind of said, wow, that's great. I mean, is lying or was just trying to like sound cool. Yeah. Like to be hip. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, to be indie. Yeah. 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 I mean, you have to kind of absorb what, what's going on here and almost study it because it's not about the songs and it's not about the, the, um, tracks so much as it is about kind of the overall picture being painted here and the overall uniqueness and innovation taking place. That's really what Loveless is about. So, you know, you even going track by track on this is going to be a little tricky because, you know, it's really about, you know, you compared it to a film earlier that the, the, the album almost behaves more like that, where you have to sort of take it in totality. I mean, you're not going to add Loomer to like one of your playlists, you know, but when you put it kind of in the context of track two and how it's taking you from only shallow and kind of taking you into this sort of ambient place. And you're starting to hear this wash of guitar layering and guitar effect, uh, in the, the voice acting as an instrument, you know, more so than acting as, you know, going out there and having something to say and all of this, it's, it's the track that really, I think is the true sort of entry point into what these guys were trying to do. I, I agree with on that last point. I, I think it is the moment where you say this album is going to be very, very different. I'm going to disagree with you. I do think there are moments on the album that are playlist worthy and it's not a ton, but it's a handful. And I would say that they're very playlist worthy. And we will certainly get to well, one I, of those I, near the I agree with that. I was just saying that Loomer is probably not one of them. So Loomer is definitely not one of them. No doubt. And neither is track three <laughs> touched, which is a very short instrumental. It's actually less than a minute. So we're going to skip it. What, what's notable about touched is that it's the only piece on the album. That's not written by Kevin Shields. It's a Como Kasich composition, right? And so Kevin Shields, it, it, this is the only song we'll admit that other people played on it, that, that Como actually played on it. So that leads into track four, which is to hear knows when. This is probably the the biggest example of that dissonance that you were talking about, that, that kind of almost uncomfortable idea. But again, if you pay attention to what the guitar is doing, you know, it, it, it certainly provides you with a science experiment that you can listen to for decades and try and figure it out. But there is this very almost gorgeous vocal that's going on behind it as well, presumably from Belinda Butcher. So here you, you do start to just see that contradiction. You know, they're not, they're not even trying to be pretty at this moment. It's almost taking something beautiful and then putting this almost hideously dissonant thing over the top of it. It's a, it's an interesting way to continue an album. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a hard listen, you know, I mean, you know, you're, you're kind of trying to figure the thing out and, and there are plenty of moments, particularly the back half of the record that, you know, become a little bit more accessible and, and easy to understand, you know, to hear knows when to me is where you start to get into borderline. Okay. This is just noise. Now, you know, there are some kind of cool wavy guitar things going on. And for about 30 seconds, that's cool. After about four minutes, that becomes a little irritating. Um, so again, appreciation for what's being done here, but that's, that's a tough track to plow through in my view. Trek five, I think is a playlist classic and, uh, it actually was the, it wasn't an official single, but it was a promo single that was released in advance of the album. It's got an interesting story behind it, and that is the song When You Sleep. You know, when you hear this, you think this is where 
the band Lush came from and you know Ride didn't come from this but this sounds like some of the things that Ride would eventually do and slow dive and yeah you know it, it does have a pace to it with the drum samples that are being used it, it actually this is all Kevin Shields vocals it's the one track that he kind of gave a glimpse into and he said that Belinda's voice is nowhere on this so it, it's a good example of some of the varying vocal styles that you can hear from Kevin but this uh to me this song is important because it gets back to more of a, a song structure that that sort of makes sense. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think as tough as the track before this is to kind of, you know, slug your way through, this is one where you hear it and you're like, wow, this was in 1991. Like that's nuts. I mean, that's, that's pretty crazy that at that point before any of these other things had happened, that there was a band executing on this approach and on this sound. It's really cool. It's really, really cool. It's a sort of atmospheric sound that no one had ever produced before with a, a bit of kind of a driving nature to it. I mean, it's a, it's a pretty good rocker, you know, by my bloody Valentine standards. I mean, it's got, um, it's basically got a hook at it. Too. Yeah. I mean, that, it's a hook, man, whether, whether yeah. Shields likes it or not, you know? Yeah, it is. And, and you start to get some of that here again, sort of middle and, and back half of the record, which I think was appreciated. You know, a lot of the sort of intense shoegaze piece is great and, and it, it definitely is important in kind of, again, the entire album as a piece. But, you know, I think some of these areas that become certainly layered and certainly innovative, but a little bit more accessible to the ear, something you can at least kind of sort of, you know, tap your foot to a little bit, um, I think is part of what, what made Loveless acclaimed. You know, if they just tried to get out there and push the boundaries too far and get too noisy and too shoegazy, you know, I don't, I don't know that it would have kind of had the relevance or, or kind of the footing that it's had really in its 30 years of existence now. So I think tracks like this are, are part of what really took an album that was unique and um, kind of a whole new sound for people to absorb, but, but took it up a level to where it would have been as a kind of more, you know, avant-garde noisy piece to something that actually gave you some songs and some tracks individually that you could really kind of grab onto that it's probably one of the more tangible songs in addition to only shallow here with uh when you sleep so yeah i think it's a great piece of the album here on, on track five well hey you know it's to keep the commercialism going commercialism yeah right <laughs> like like these songs like you know should have been on top of the pops or something people dancing to them you know but it, it, certainly the the kind of commercial middle continues with track six and that is i only said It's basically like a slowed down, slowed down version of when you sleep. You know, it's got the the high guitar melody. In this case, it's a hook, man. Yeah, it's a hook. It, it's a hook that's completely different from anything else that was around at the time, for sure. But uh, I mean, the tone that he's getting, you know, see, I know it's a it's a large mix of complex pedals and things like that. And again, I think you're looking at a lot of analog pedals at the time, but. You just wonder, and as a guitarist, you know, how does Shields piece together these tones? You know, I mean, what what is he using? What is he piecing together? Is it is there a science behind it, or is it purely just like trial and error and trying to see what sticks? <laughs> I don't know. Probably more the latter, as far as the development of the sound. But you know, a lot of it has to do with how he's playing too. I mean, you know, this was not you wouldn't be able to just get this sound just like the tone. I mean, you've talked about drummer tone. I mean, certainly guitarist tone you know, pedals and effects can only take you so far. And a lot of the things he was doing as far as, you know, loosening strings and using the tremolo bar to kind of create this wavy sound and have it all make sense, you know, and again, you know, pushing amplifiers to max in order to create a certain clipping or, or sort of pushed output sound. I mean, there, there certainly are a lot of things you got to dial up in order to get these sounds, but obviously you got to play a certain way too. And you know, I, I don't know that he was a, a, a shredder. Uh, I don't know that he was, uh, you know, could get up there and play, you know, SRV style blues. 
But I'll tell you what, he innovated the instrument and made it sound uh, a way that it had never sounded before. And you've heard this replicated over the years. But again, 1991, the, the guitar, no matter what you routed it through or what you pushed it through, had never sounded this way before. Yeah, I think th- this is a good moment here in the middle of the album that uh, you know kind of makes you understand uh, a little bit of, of why this thing... Um, was so beloved, not just by music nerds and not just by musician nerds, but by, you know, people that were just looking for a unique sound, but, you know, something that they could at least to an extent understand. And I think I only said is a, is a great uh, means for that. That concludes side one. You flip the album here to take a look at my original pressing of what is, you see a beat up. It is. It is. (laughs) Do you you see it? (laughs) That's pretty beat up. This I've had this for a long time. It's got a lot of spins and a lot of love. You know, Mrs. Nubs, you know, listens to it all the time. You know? Oh, yeah. This is definitely a, a big with the wives. This is one for the ladies. Yeah, there's no question. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's a very nicked up version, but, uh, but a this lovely probably, one nonetheless. The, Loveless is probably the only album that chicks would hate more than Rush, I think. Yeah, or yeah. Tool. I mean, chicks hate Tool some chicks that like tool but uh really yeah but but uh rush and yeah R- rush is my bloody valentine are rush is pretty, a problem yeah <laughs> rush is a problem yeah yeah so yeah th- th- this is uh so we're flipping the the record here and going into side two and song seven and a track that i just think is s- such an awesome track which is coming alone It's sort of like only shallows distant cousin, but it's just, it's got this chord progression that I think is so emotional. It's so moving, you know, it's, it, again, it's got some melody in it and this album is not, you know, it's not known for its melody, but the way that that chord progression of three different movements kind of slides into one another and it, it just relentless in it's slow driving pace. I, I just, I think this is magnificent. I think it's one of the best tracks in the album. And I, I think it captures the power of Loveless because Loveless isn't just droning noise. I think that anybody who thinks that hasn't spent enough time with it. This is a song with a deep, deep groove and a lot of open space and, and a chord progression that I think is as emotional as anything else from the era. This may be a first um, as far as uh, you know, something that anyone's said about this album ever. but. Uh... I love the drums on Come In Alone, you know, <laughs> that uh, chugging of, of kind of that ride symbol and the, the, it's a song with quite a bit of backbeat to it that, um, again, once you kind of climb through a lot of the noise stuff, um, you get to kind of, a, a I think, a drum progression, you know, kind of something that really walks you along nicely on the track. So, yeah, I kind of found myself uh, paying actually paying attention to the drums quite a bit on this, which uh, I'm sure whoever the hell the drummer is probably appreciates that. You know, what I hear more than anything T is a Nick Mason influence, you know, it, it that kind yeah. of relentlessness and nobody kept tempo better than Nick Mason. And he could play really open yet really full. He, he could play powerful, even though he wasn't playing super hard. Yeah. I hear a ton of that on this album. And I know a lot of the drum parts were sampled and chopped, but I think you make a great call that that's a significant part of this. And I hear a lot of Nick Mason influence for sure. Well, I knew mentioning the drums would make you happy if nothing else. <laughs> yeah, right. Very joyful. Very joyful. All right. See track eight. Sometimes. Not a big fan of sometimes. T, I, I find it a little boring. I think it's a, it's a little bit long for what it does, or should I say, doesn't do. And it's sort of a repeat of of Loomer and sort of this, you know, thumping thing going on 
with noise on top of it and then some vocals. You know, it just this is one of the first songs on the record that I just kind of think, ah, it's it's kind of doing something we already heard, you know? Yeah, I mean that that sort of revved up sort of I don't know what it is. It sounds like maybe a distorted bass. Uh, or at least, you know, a, a really sort of tuned down uh, guitar with kind of a lot of dirt on it. You know, that's kind of neat for a little bit, but then it just sort of never, you know, to your point, it just kind of never goes anywhere. And I know that that's sometimes a lot of the gripe on Loveless is that you have a lot of great concepts here, but a lot of times where that becomes repetitive or, you know, that sort of lacks dynamics. Because there aren't a lot of dynamics on the record, you know, it's pretty, it's pretty zero to 60, you know, and, and I think that this is a good example of one where a little bit of ebb and flow and a little bit of peak and valley probably wouldn't hurt. Instead, you just kind of get this revving sort of thing happening at the same level throughout. And it's probably the type of track that while you've seen some dynamics in the couple of tracks that preceded this, you know, it's one that probably presents kind of an easy flip for a lot of people that are working their way through the record because um, it's pretty stagnant. Side two continues with uh, kind of another thought that's a little bit the same idea to, you know, there's just a little bit of a lag here as you get into the second half of the album that is blown a wish. Now, the thing I do really love is is the dreamy vocal from Belinda Butcher. Clearly from her, right? I mean, we could say that, I think, on this one. I mean, it's beautiful. Those glistening guitars and the vocal. Yeah, I mean, it's it's gorgeous. Yeah, and it's got a lightness to it that I do appreciate. I think it's just the reality that you kind of heard some of these sounds earlier. And and it's just, it's like anything else. You know, a little less blown away when you hear a little bit of a repeat of of what happened before, but I, I, but I do like the lightness of it. I think that uh, her vocal performance is stunning. You know, this is the type of track that I, I think could have been just something special had they created a little bit of ebb and flow to it, a little bit of dynamics to it. So, you know, it's beautiful guitar sounds and, you know, again, just noises that you hadn't heard before. And I like it. I think it's a great track, you know, as you kind of get down the stretch here, but you know, again, it's it's almost like, you know, take the concepts and, and build off of them and work from them and, and create kind of a story in of the track itself. And, it, it you know, it seemed like a lot of colors and shapes here. It's kind of a you know typical artistic statement from a very artistic person. You can tell that there was sort of a album sort of vibe being built here. But within the song, sort of an intra track building of a vibe didn't really seem to happen in most cases. And this is a good example, I think, of a track that could have been something really dynamic and really special. And again, it just kind of is one of those where, you know, you really respect the sounds that are being made and it's really beautiful, but kind of leaves you wanting more a little bit, which I think, again, is a common criticism of Loveless is taking some of these concepts and and really building from them a little bit more. But hey, again, this is 1991 and they were pushing the boundaries and creating something new. So it's easier for me to say 30 years later of what could have been done with some of these things. But, uh, you know, I think it's a good track all in all. Well said all around T for sure. Track 10 has the, uh, the rather unenviable task of (laughs) coming before, uh, what has to be cited as one of the most important songs of the decade. And we'll get to that, but first you have to get through what you want. It's pretty no holds barred. You know, I, I think it's it's all up in the mix. You know, one of the things about Loveless that most people don't know is it was recorded basically in mono. Kevin Shields just wanted everything up front, you know, everything front and center. So there was, there's not a lot of stereo panning and things like that that are going on in, in the initial recording. All that being said, it's an amazing headphones album, but it's a lot of mono. With that, you know, I, I like that everything's just blasting out front. One of the things about My Bloody Valentine on this in this era and on this tour, their live shows were so loud that literally people like would lose their minds and they would leave. They'd come out and play for a couple of minutes and the, the sound was just so loud. I mean, it was shockingly loud. 
and you can imagine what you want being one of those songs that just, uh, you know, two eleven every single time. So I like that aspect of it. It doesn't have a lot of feel to it, uh, but it's, it's kind of a relentless kind of drum cycle with uh, these big swirling guitars on top of it, you know? Yeah. It kind of makes you think of some of the early dinosaur junior. I know that I'm not sure who influenced who I, I got to think that because Jay Maskus was doing a lot of this stuff early on too. So I don't know if that was more, you know, coinciding with one another, but it kind of reminds me of some of those things happening as well, which was another incredibly loud concert, uh, by the way. But, uh, Oh yeah. My ears still hurt from that one, dude. Yeah. So it was amazing, but, uh, amazingly loud that is, but yeah, you know, it, it, by this point you're kind of like a little bit like, okay, I kind of get it, but yeah, I mean, to your point, it leads you up to the last track, which is something pretty special. Special indeed. I think when you think about Loveless, I mean, most legendary albums do have this bookend thing where they start in a memorable way and they close in a memorable way. This closes in, in a way that's memorable and really, really important in a song that is, it, it's just an absolute masterwork. And that is the six minutes and 58 seconds of Soon. So, you know, the close up shop here, Kevin Shields delivers this, this dance beat, you know, almost out of nowhere, you get yeah. this, I mean, it's a dance floor beat, essentially. Yeah. The song starts and you're like, what the hell? Like, <laughs> yeah. what is, what is going on here? Hey T, roll the beginning of it. Cause it, the, the, you're about to hear one of my favorite moments in all of music. And that is when, when everything crashes in after the initial intro, I just, I think it's so glorious. Let, let's hear that, that intro. I mean, <laughs> that is so good. And the electronic drum beat is, is so uh, dynamic. You know, it's, it's, you can really pull it out of the mix. And for the first time on the album, you're like, it's a groove. You know, you're really tapping your foot. You're, you're along with uh, something that's, you know, it's almost danceable in a way. And you yeah. would have ever thought that, you know? Well, that's what I was thinking. It was like, Man, was he intending for this to be like the encore? You know, you come out and get everybody busting a move on the way out before they go home. It's amazing how modern it is. You know, I mean, this is 30 years ago. This sounds like, you know, something that obviously has been replicated a ton and damn near sounds like the, uh, you know, your, your favorite genre in mind festival rock, you know, these days in terms <laughs> of, you know, getting kind of some of those electronic layers working together and getting some of those and there's a lot of rhythm to this song you know whether it's the sort of guitar chop or the drum beat i mean it's you know it's a it's a very rhythmic song a very upbeat song musically and yeah. well and how about really, to your point see how about the do 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 yeah, i mean, that, I mean it's almost like a hip-hop loop you know yeah yeah and, and it sort of does come out of nowhere i mean it's a very pleasant way to close what is a a pretty complex work you know to that point and I think it's part of the charm of it, right? I mean, this is not, you know, I think if they just closed with one other sort of dreary shoegazy type deal, you know, by that point, you'd probably be like, all right, you know, I, I sort of, I sort of understood what was going on by track six here and the rest of it just kind of, you know, fades off. Well, closing with something like soon probably is what makes this a classic in the eyes of many. And again, you know, showed that, they're not just being innovative here with noise and with sort of guitar wash. This is a very, um, in a lot of ways, sort of ahead of its time type type track, considering that, you know, something that nowadays sounds, you know, so modern and, and so um, relevant was created 30 years ago, well before any of those type of sounds were in, were in play or were in motion. So. Yeah, a really special way, I think, to close out a, a really unique album in a way that's uh, something that I think everybody, no matter what you think, as you kind of knife through the track by track, I think everybody can agree that you sort of land 
in a very memorable place in closing with soon. And to your point about bookends, I mean, there's no question that this is a record that starts and finishes in an extremely uh, memorable way. Soon, it probably he is aged better than any song that I could think of from the early 90s. And I think it's opened yeah. up all sorts of new possibilities for pop music. I know Brian Eno has spoken very highly of it. And he, he to me, is an authority on all things music and all things art. If he says it's good, I'm like, okay, I'm in. And he basically said, you know, this song sort of sets a new expectation, a new standard for pop music. And you, you can't give much higher praise than that for a single song. But I, I'm just impressed. And I think you pointed out perfectly just how amazingly, how supremely this song has aged. It sounds so fresh and so new and led to so many copycats just from this one track. And I cannot imagine what it was like to listen to this song in 1991. I could tell you that in 1994, 95, when I first really started getting into this band, it was pretty mind blowing then as well. And, and still continues to be today. I just think it's an exceptional piece of music and one that should be held up with one of the best things of the decade for sure. All right. See, well, we made it through Loveless. How about that? It wasn't that bad, right? I mean, we're kind of, <laughs> we came out pretty unscathed, I would say. So, yeah. you know, let's, uh, let's talk about it. See, does Loveless matter? Oh God. Yeah. It matters a lot. This is an incredibly influential and important work and you don't have to love it to realize that, you know, some of the sounds that came even shortly after this different acts that sort of took this way of utilizing the guitar in different noisy sort of fuzzy ways. And also vocally, this is a unique approach to vocals. You know, and I, you know, even one of my favorite bands currently, Silver Sun Pickups. I mean, this is a vocal approach that's lifted directly. Oh, I, dude, they listen to so much My Buddy Valentine, <laughs> when you could tell. Yeah. No question. No question. And, and so, you know, you can find the influence of Loveless all over the place. And, you know, it's a fascinating work in that, you know, the way it was made and, to your point, it's just like Heaven's Gate. It's like you don't have to like the movie to sort of be fascinated by the story of it and the approach and the sort of learnings and takeaways from it and the uh, sometimes intentional and sometimes unintentional influences that it had. And I think all those things apply. It's a great comparison. But, you know, bottom line is that, you know, to think that this record was made three decades ago. At a time where, you know, pop and R&B and these type of things were topping the charts and grunge was this sort of like brand new thing that was hadn't even broke through yet. And you've got this, you know, band out of Ireland that, you know, <laughs> comes up with these really unique, innovative sounds. It's startling that this was made in 1991 at that time. and just goes to show you that um again you don't have to like love every song and you don't have to you know you don't even have to necessarily be super into this but man you've got to appreciate it you've got to respect it so yeah it's a record that that really mattered and i think has a stamp on a lot of work that followed thereafter throughout the 90s and, and certainly well beyond how about you nub did it matter yeah, it certainly did. And, and my evidence for that is I'm amazed at how many young musicians kind of worship at the throne of Loveless. I'm talking about, you know, young musicians that are kind of teenagers right now. As we've talked about before on the podcast, I, I run and operate a nonprofit music studio for kids. And I'm stunned at the amount of our students who know this album, love this album, can speak the loveless language, kind of know the story behind it and clearly influenced by it. And that is pretty cool when you're talking about an album that literally is 30 years old and not just the time in between T, but think about the, the amount of albums that were released in 1990, 91, 92, 93, that young musicians would have no clue about today. You know, they wouldn't, they wouldn't know it. They wouldn't own it. They wouldn't find passion for it. Loveless is one of those that I think will live on in the hearts, minds, and curiosity of young musicians for many generations. Hopefully it doesn't wear off 
in the way that we've talked about, which is that this album would be a lot easier to make nowadays than it was then. And hopefully the fascination of some of its controversial aspects wouldn't wear off. But for young musicians today to continue to discover this record and find fascination with it, I think speaks a tremendous amount of volumes, almost as much volume as they performed live with to how uh, important this album is and its impact and how generational that could become. You know, and that's why we, I want to shout out Dan M again for the listener uh, recommendation to do this album because it's, it is a really important work and whether it's enjoyable or not at all points is, is not really the point. It's really about its legacy and its influence. And both of those things are as strong as anything else I've ever seen. So certainly matters to you, but mattering and your final cut could be two different things. So oh, yes. yes. Your final cut could have Loveless on the turntable. It could have Loveless in the collection. It could have it collecting dust and it could have it in the for sale bin. So T, where are you putting Loveless for your final cut? You can't put this in the for sale bin. I mean, you just can't. It's it's too freaking important. It, you know, we probably um, get canceled. We get canceled. Yeah. 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 I, I love the movie Hoosiers, you know, the basketball movie, right? Coach Norman Dale, all that. And there's this part in Hoosiers that I love where it's still kind of early and Norman Dale is sort of implementing this new system and philosophy on this team. And they're playing one of their early games. Shooter, you know, who eventually became the assistant coach is, you know, this is still when he's just like rolling into the games all hammered and everything. And there's this part where one of his players fouls out and they only have six players on the team. So one of the guys had disobeyed him. You know, he had ran the wrong play or whatever. And instead of putting him in the game so that he can have a full team on the floor, he stays with four guys. Just kind of a crazy, like the ultimate sending a message to your team that you screwed up. And there's this part where Shooter, the drunk guy, kind of rolls in and he's watching the game and he makes this face because the whole crowd's like yelling at Norman Dale. It's like, what are you doing? You got to put in your fifth player or whatever. And he's staying true to this lesson he's trying to teach his team and that he's trying to teach his player that is, you know, you disobey me, you're not going to get on the floor, even if it means we're not going to have a freaking full team on the floor. And they show Shooter and he's kind of smiling and shaking his head like the only person in the arena that understands what he's doing. He totally understands what the coach is doing and everyone's yelling at him and throwing stuff except for Shooter and he's kind of got this smirk like, oh man, like... I know what he's doing and he's doing the right thing. There's a little bit of an element when you listen to a record like this, where it's like a lot of people may say, what the hell is this? It's noise. It's whatever. But you kind of like have that little, it's like, yeah, I, I know what they're doing. I get it. You know, I get it. There's an element of that to this where I really don't like the record. I mean, I don't like, I wouldn't like sit and listen to it. You know, it's not something that's pleasant to the ears, but. I have a real appreciation for what they're doing. I'm kind of like shooter in the stands. It's like, yeah, yeah. Like, you know, once you kind of get through all the cosmetics of it, it's like, I'm really, really dialed in on kind of what they were trying to do and what they accomplished, which I think is a really important work. I'm going to go collecting dust just because I really don't like the album that much, but I have a ton of respect for it. And borderline, you know, feel like it should be in everybody's collection. It, it may or may not find its way into mine. I don't think it's a must own for everybody, but boy, I've got a ton of, you know, adoration for it. And it's nice to revisit and be able to kind of cut through the clutter and really understand what they were going for, what they were trying to do. And in a lot of ways, it's sort of the signal noise thing. They were sending a signal that you could take a completely different approach to an instrument, to a sound, and to an execution of something that, you know, they didn't give a crap whether or not it did well commercially or not. I think artistically it accomplished what they were hoping for. And that's neat. Whether you like the album or not, whether you're going to sit and listen to it a lot or not, there's something very cool once you sort of click and understand what they were going for. And I think they accomplished exactly what they were intending to do. And that's pretty cool. So where's the final cut for you, Nub? Well, you know, right off the bat, I, I want to put it on the turntable because it's got soon on it, you know, but in reality, it, it's in the collection. 
I think you make a lot of excellent points. You know, enjoyable listen or not for some parties is is a more than understandable argument to have. But for importance and its kind of longstanding role in shaping young musicians and sparking creativity. And this whole idea, you know, getting back to the Heaven's Gate thing, the fact that sometimes it takes years to appreciate things and you have to get through some of the bumps in the road that happened during the creation itself and just appreciate it for what it is. Appreciate the beauty of it. Appreciate the magnificence. Appreciate the detail that went into it, the painstaking effort and some of the sacrifice. Kevin Shields virtually sacrificed his music career to make this record. and. You got to love the steadfastness and you got to love, yeah, you might say stubbornness, but I would say commitment to the artistic process and and the artistic goal. And for all those reasons, I I think it's in the collection. I think it's one of those records that does need to be in a proper collection. Probably don't want to listen to it every day, top to bottom. You know, that might become, uh, it, it might take some of the edge off of the album a little bit, right? If you're getting a little too familiar with some of the kind of extreme aspects of it. But for me, I just, I have it solidly in the collection, but you should listen to soon at least once a week. Just saying. Mm. Yeah. Soon is pretty awesome. Not going to lie. All right, T let's uh, wrap things up by shifting from an album. We're going to some songs here and get into three things that are in your head. T roll Dolores. In your head, in your head. T three tracks in your head. What do you got? All right. Well, the first is uh, a song by a band Sloan. I know we both enjoy another Canada outfit. And this is uh, called Listen to the Radio. One of my favorite tracks from those guys. One of many favorite tracks from those guys. Uh, Nubs, you know, My Bloody Valentine, it just made me want to listen to Starflyer 59. One of my favorite groups of all time. And, uh, you know, certainly their early work. And in this case, their early, early work, as in their first record. Um very influenced by my bloody Valentine, essentially a rip off of, of that band. I think for their first two or three records, the, the, the silver, the gold, and then the Americana record, which are all fantastic, a little bit of a different twist, but clearly there's my bloody Valentine all over the early work from Starflyer 59 and the track sled, which is, uh, just, <laughs> I love sled. Oh, just that one's so great. Good. I mean, yeah. the, the, the whole silver and gold record, you didn't even Americana, their first three records, which just, fantastic but yeah jason martin clearly heavily heavily influenced by those guys and uh thirdly i have typo negative this band you may have heard of and this is the long epic 14 minute piece called these three things oh yeah nubs what's in your head buddy what's in my head is a lot of dusty hill and what i mean is three songs lagrange give me all your loving and cheap sunglasses all by ZZ Top. I've been trying to recognize the loss of Dusty Hill, which is a huge loss to the music world. It's such yes. a bummer because ZZ Top was going to head back out on the road and I never got to see the band and always wanted to. And I was thinking, ah, if they, you know, they didn't play Michigan a lot, but I thought if they come here, I really want to go see them. And now we'll, we'll not have that opportunity. Yeah. But uh, those three tracks from ZZ Top, man, and, and just trying to keep that band in mind because man are they good yeah <laughs> so yeah good. very good so that is what is in my head t appreciate your thoughts on loveless man this was one of those going into it when dan m gave us the suggestion i thought oh i can't wait to hear what t has to say and i appreciate your insight man as always it's a great record a great experience to revisit and uh and thank you dan m for uh selecting it thank you for all your wonderful musical taste very tasty. You're a very, very tasty gentleman. You know, very tasty. Dan, I'm keep, keep we gazing at you. those shoes, my good man. Keep gazing at your shoes. We will gaze at our shoes now for a while here after this, uh, you know, this triumph, right? T of episode 54, real triumph, if you will. Well, if we may say so ourselves. Yeah, sure. That's right. Exactly. So we will see you again very soon for episode, let's see, 54, carry the one. 55. T will be leading us through more fun and excitement. Five, five. Five, five. And we ask that all of you take care of yourselves and take care of each other. And we will see you very soon on the next edition of Two Twins and an Album. Two Twins and an Album. Well, 
that's about it. That's all we have. I hope it wasn't too disappointing. We will see you on tour. Until then, take it easy.